Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll visit a Southern California Railway Historical Society, as well as one of the oldest garden railroads in the country. We'll enter the magic world of the Sunset Valley Oregon Railroad, cross the country to Vermont's scenic Queechy Gorge Village for a toy and train museum, and ride through the scenic beauty of the Finger Lake region of New York State. Now, Southern California is home to many things involving railroads. We discovered a fantastic display of railroad history, as well as one of the oldest and possibly the largest public garden railroads in the United States. Children of all ages can be found at the Los Angeles County Fairgrounds, or Fairplex, where there's a wide variety of activities for railroad lovers. Our first stop is a Southern California chapter of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society, where you'll find some great examples of California's railroad heritage. The Arcadia Station is uh, an original Santa Fe Depot, came from Arcadia, uh, built in uh, 1895, and we got the depot in 1969 in another location here on the fairgrounds. In 1989, it was moved down here. Well, we have uh, the largest diesel locomotive that's been built. We have the largest steam engine that's been built. We have three-cylinder locomotives. We have the largest uh, 412-2 and the largest 410-2. Our most well-known is the big boy. It's the best, best shape of any of them that have been preserved. And we have people from all over the world come to visit and look at our big boy. The largest display is the Fairplex Garden Railroad. It's the oldest garden layout in the country. The miniature railroad came to life at the Los Angeles County Fair in 1924 as a simple diorama. The intent of the original display was to create an attraction that people would look at during the LA County Fair so that they would see Pudding Stone Dam to come out and visit Pudding Stone Reservoir in the surrounding area. The Pacific Electric was involved as an additional player as a way for people to come out and visit the Pudding Stone Dam area. So the first display, the first diorama, had the background and then it had a trolley in it as what we understand the trolley was not operating. The display remained within the fair's tent for the next 10 fairs, growing slowly as an operating miniature railroad. In 1935, there were no miniature trains of this size commercially available, so each locomotive and piece of rolling stock had to be handmade. Enter Herman and Homer Howard. Herman Howard was a Pomona High School shop teacher who was contacted to build the original display, and he did all the construction. His brother, Homer, helped him with the electrical wiring and the diorama when it was first built. Students assisted Mr. Howard on the construction of several of the uh, different locomotives and rolling stock. Rolling stock would include uh, flat cars, box cars, tank cars, and everything was constructed from scratch. The trains were originally built to one half inch scale and they were built from plans that Mr. Howard obtained from the railroads. The Howards kept the place alive by annually running the train during the LA County Fair. In 1958, the Howard family sold the operation. After passing through several local ownerships, Fairplex eventually took title to the railroad in 1970. The railroad was a popular attraction and Fairplex wanted to revitalize the aging display. Enter the Southern California Garden Railway Society. That group came out and uh, took out all the old half-inch track and put in new modern G-gauge track. And at the time, they put down about 5,000 feet of track. They brought out their own trains for the next fair. And for the 1997 fair, they were able to operate and uh, have the trains running. Physical labor wasn't the most important item of the new relationship between Fairplex and the society. In working in conjunction with our coordinator, Bob Tui, they developed a business plan. This business plan, which we still use today, is a comprehensive document that states how the Fairplex will interact with the Garden Railroad. It explains the projects that we'll work on here at the Garden Railroad. And most importantly, it covers how the volunteers will be organized 
and that's crucial for coverage during the annual LA County Fair. Our volunteer crew is critical to the ongoing success of this exhibit. We have, of our, over of our 70 some volunteers, we staff 10 people for every one of the 10 hours that the fair is open every day for all 23 days of the fair. And that works out to over 2,300 hours every year that we put in for the fair. Of course, we're slightly biased in our viewpoint of, of our importance, but we like to see that the majority of the people that come to the fair are do visit the Garden Railroad. Uh, in fact, our annual attendance at the LA Fair ranges between 1.3 and 1.4 million people, and exit surveys have showed that approximately 80% of those people are exposed to the Garden Railroad one way or the other. The various trains and trolleys operate past several scenes depicting California history from the 1850s to present day, and wander throughout the mountains over the lakes and streams and through the gardens. Yeah, some of the areas that we're proud of are our mountain area, which has over 100 dwarf Alberta spruce trees that are carefully trimmed and thinned out to resemble real trees. Um, another area is our western area. The western area is one of our two interactive areas that allows visitors during the fair to control the trains, and that's very popular with uh, young adults and kids of all ages, I suppose. The area that gets the most visibility is the front end of what we call Main Street on the front of the exhibit, which goes from the Old West down to pretty much present day. And that covers uh, a variety of buildings from a uh, car show to a housing development under construction to some of the buildings that are actually historic to Southern California and the Pomona area, including the Fox uh, Theater and the Mayfair Hotel, which are on our main street. The railroad has over 10,000 feet of track in the three main lines and over 8,000 feet of wiring. The trains and the buildings are all powered by electricity systems, which basically have been here since the 1950s. Uh, we've taken some of those circuits and upgraded them with modern uh, components, but the main controls, the controls that uh, allow us to move the trains, are, uh, were built, as far as we know, in the 50s, and they're still performing very, very well. Because it's a garden railroad, there is plenty of work for the landscape people. On the front and down Main Street, we have junipers and boxwood trees. These are common shrubs that you can find in any nursery. It's just that we have to trim them in a certain way so that they resemble real trees. And that takes a lot of maintenance in terms of our volunteers. We have people that do nothing but come out and just trim trees. And we have volunteers who come out who really don't have expertise in uh, any particular area, but they just come out and pull weeds. And those people are as valuable to us as anybody else. The layout is open the first Sunday of every month, and of course, we're open and operating every day during the annual LA County Fair, which is in September and the first weekend in October. Whether you find yourself at the Los Angeles County Fair or are just passing by, stop at Fairplex in Pomona and visit a California treasure. Fairplex is usually open the first Sunday of each month, so if you're in the area, stop in Pomona and check it out. Model railroaders know that having friends around to help out only enhances the experience. We're about to meet a Michigan man and woman who bring together a great number of people for their Pacific Northwest Railroad. Bruce Chubb's Sunset Valley, Oregon system takes prototype railroads to a whole new level. The vision is to, to create something which replicates uh, life in 1955 in the Pacific Northwest and how 10 prototype railroads or real railroads operated in 1955. When the many operators of the SVOS gather, their everyday cares melt away. It's like living with a magic world. And when these uh, 
fellows have a throttle in their hand and they're in charge of a train and it's traversing through this magic world that's been created, they, the rest of the world ceases to exist and this magic world is the focus. But Bruce's main focus isn't the trains and tracks. It's the teammates who come together to operate the SVOS. Without that team, there would be no railroad. If I was doing it myself, I'd still be building the first bench worker, putting the first lumber in. And you've got really most all the advantages of a club without the disadvantage of a politics. We'll have any place from 25 to 35, maybe even guests up to 45. Uh, at one time down here for like an eight hour session, we'll run about 125 trains during that period of time. It's the group effort and running it as a team where everybody is doing their job on the railroad to make the whole thing hum. There's 38 individuals currently that are working and operating on the system. Each one has a specialty that they particularly enjoy and have been given the freedom to express their talent on this railroad. They work together, but so much of the railroad has been influenced by the crew. I have my own railroad, and when I come over here, I always go home with new ideas and, and things that I've got to do on my own railroad because one of the guys here would have said something or made a comment or suggested something, and I'll say, hey, you know, that'll work for me. And so I do that. As you can see behind me, we have a highly sophisticated computer control system operating this model railroad. We take great care in wiring practices to make sure everything is well documented and put in place uh, in such a way that we can quickly and easily solve any problems. A friend of, our, of mine is uh, actually a member of a local club I belong to. Uh, brought us uh, a whole group of us from the club down here and uh, Bruce and I seemed to hit it off and I volunteered to help work on the, on the layout and specialize in his logging operations. A lot of, of the crew members have been 25, 30 years and a lot of younger people are coming on they're going to have the same longevity and we'll all do just about anything for each other and we okay. really pull together as a unified ultimate team is what I would call it. It's about the team, it's about the friendships. Our circle of friends are all primarily in the hobby and we share a lot of good times together. It is an extended family. In fact, several of the crew members have even mentioned that. Gee, we come here, it's just like being part of a family and I think we're that close. Oh, I think my favorite part is just being part of a group of people operating on one of the finest model railroads that exists. And just the opportunity to be part of that uh, is, is what I look forward to. My favorite part is uh, the camaraderie. Uh, met a lot of nice people here, um, learning a lot of stuff. I guess the thing I enjoy most here is just being able to say that I'm part of this. Uh, John Allen's Gory and Defeated Railroad has been gone for more than 30 years and they still write about it in the press. This is a model railroad we'll still be talking about in a hundred years, and I can at least say I was there and I was part of it. Not just talking about it, but operating it too. At least, that's Bruce's plan for the future of the SVOS. We want to preserve it for all time. You'll always be adding detail and refinements, but the railroad is built into movable sections that can be taken apart so you can unbolt it all apart and move it out and the goal someday is to have it set up under a foundation and as a museum of its own. A railroad of the past for future generations to enjoy. The Sunset Valley Oregon system. Bruce, Janet and crew have a wonderful time in the operating sessions. New York has long been home to some of the nation's oldest railroads, and while most have passed into history, there is still one which has combined passenger and freight operations to keep making money in the 21st century. In a minute, we'll take a visit. Now, all of us have had favorite toys when we were young, and as we grew, those toys became lost, broken, or discarded. But in southern Vermont, there is a place where you can relive your youth and see those playthings once again. And of course, there are trains. Gary Neal and his wife have owned the Queechee Gorge Village since 1988. 
Here you will find artists, wineries, specialty shops, antiques, restaurants, and the Vermont Toy and Train Museum, a toy collection unrivaled in New England. We think it's perfect. Uh, it's a, an opportunity for people to see things that they had and inspires them to collect after they've, they've seen the toys. And uh, it also uh, educates them as to uh, what is possible to bring home. Toys bring a sense of passion and fun into your life, and it uh, usually evokes some kind of a happy memory. The expression that keeps coming up is, I had one of those. In fact, our stickers remind people that others say, say the same comments, but I had one of those is truly echoed. Trains are perhaps the single toy that evokes the fondest memories and the lasting memories among children. The train layouts are very important to people who have had trains, who remember their experiences they had with their parents or with their friends, but they are uh, very powerful in terms of bringing back good memories. We acquired the train layouts 10 years ago and we moved them initially into storage. And after that, we uh, assembled them uh, on this site, Quichi Gorge Village. And after it had been there for three years, we needed to relocate them. More artisans moved into the property and subsequently we moved the train layouts here in its present location. Although Gary didn't have a train layout like the ones in his museum, he still realized that trains are the quintessential toy. As an adult, Gary doesn't pretend to be a true blue train guy. So when the real train guys showed up, he was more than happy for the help and expertise. Not being a model railroader myself, I, I did not realize the amount of work, the amount of skill and effort that it took to get these up and running and keep them running. So uh, in my pursuit to bring the layouts together, I began reading books and have been fortunate enough to meet some people who have helped me along the way. There's a book on model railroading scenery that was written by David Frary. That book features this layout, which was a surprise to me, and an entire segment on changing seasons. Fate intervened in the form of a local model railroader, John Gorecki. But really, who found whom? John found me. John uh, is probably someone who would travel and see model railroads wherever he would go. And one day came forward and said, gee, do you mind if I help you with your, your layout? It looks as though it needs a little bit of work. One of the trains is off the tracks. I was thrilled that he asked. We got to know each other better over the next couple of weeks. And he began to do work on the engines, on the scenery, keeping the track fresh. And he put together a crew, gentlemen who are very passionate, very caring for not just this layout, but other layouts. And uh, they're responsible for reinstalling this, this layout. They took it apart. They made drawings to reassemble it, cataloged it, labeled it. We moved it, and I think it's been improved since then. What sparked my interest is I came to visit the museum at one point and have always been interested in seeing trains run. When I arrived, the trains were not running. They needed some, some regular maintenance. I happened to be at the place, and Gary was here at that time, and we just started talking and said, I can fix these things and make them run for you. So since that point, I've started working with the trains and maintaining them. And then, of course, we went through the process of moving the whole layout to this point. But we had never seen a layout with four seasons like that before, uh, which pre created a certain challenge for us to try to match all of the different colors. It was a work of art built by a professional, and when we had to take it apart and re reassemble it, it was a challenge to get all of the different uh, scenery back in place. My favorite part of the smaller layout here is the actual ski train. This is a train that runs up and down from the town up to the ski slopes. It stops at each location. When it reaches the end, it reverses direction and goes back down to the other end. This is a combination of both the train part of it, but also my interest in electronics and making sure that we uh, could provide the electronics to go back and forth and stop at the different locations. The trains are a real delight for the people who visit the Vermont Toy and Train Museum but no one's more delighted than Gary Neal. I do it because it really uh, brings joy to our visitors here at Queechee Gorge Village. A key to a good toy uh, would have to be what memory it brings and uh, what inspiration it might uh, bring to a child's life. And that also includes adults. A lot of visitors to the Vermont Toy and Train Museum start with recollections of toys they once had, but they leave with some great new memories.
The Finger Lakes region in upstate New York is a mixture of old and new, rural and industry. It's no surprise that railroads played an important part in the area history. The first rail line, the Auburn and Syracuse Railroad, was chartered in 1834 with the first locomotive starting operation in 1840. Known initially as the Auburn Road, portions of the area actually saw three major railroad players, the New York Central, the Pennsylvania, and the Lehigh Valley Railroads. By the mid-20th century, all were merged into a single entity, Conrail, which operated the lines generally referred to as the Geneva Cluster. Slated for abandonment by Conrail, the lines found new life. Finger Lakes Railway was started in 1995 when a group of investors purchased what was known as the Geneva Cluster from Conrail. The purpose of the acquisition was to continue carload service to the customers that were on the line, to upgrade the maintenance of the line, and then to promote future rail use in the region. Finger Lakes Railway operates on 118 route miles, and the trackage runs from Geneva East to Syracuse, and then a section from Geneva West to Canandaigua, and another piece from Penyan to Watkins Glen. The company started with six employees, and we currently have 50 employees. Uh, we had three locomotives and now operate with 12 locomotives. And um, we, in our first year of business, we were running 5,600 car loads, and we are now up to 18,000 car loads annually. Technology has helped the Finger Lakes improve efficiency in their booming freight business. The use of remote control allows ground operators to maintain locomotive control via wireless communication. The control system is actually housed in the caboose and speed switching activities while reducing rail yard accidents. An additional component of the Finger Lakes Railway is the passenger operation. Our passenger operation started in 2000. We purchased four cars from Canadian National that were in service for Via Rail. And uh, we started running special excursions for local community groups like uh, Rotary Clubs and that has since expanded to a May through December operation, which includes holiday trains and special trains like a Blues and Brews train for adults, as well as family-friendly trips, and we visit every one of the communities that we travel through. This is one of those uh, regions that you can see everything from city landscapes to small villages. Uh, we go past beautiful bodies of water in the Finger Lakes region, as well as uh, wide open farmers fields. Visitors also travel through the Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. With more than 7,000 acres of breeding ground for migratory birds and other wildlife, it is one of the largest refuges in the Northeast. The passenger trains are headed by striking examples of railroads past. We have an EMD unit, uh, Finger Lake 1751, that's painted in the New York Central Lightning Stripes. Um, reminiscent of the former operator of the line that we travel on, the New York Central. And we also have uh, the Finger Lakes 2201, that is a U23B, uh, 2250 horsepower, and that is painted in the Lehigh Valley paint scheme um, in reminiscent of the uh, parts of the line that were former Lehigh Valley Railroad. Uh, the passenger cars are built in 1958. They were in the Via Rail system for Canadian National. They're Touring coaches, very comfortable. We've retrofitted them with heating and air conditioning. Many of the historic old stations and structures have been repurposed and are still in use along the line. Along the Finger Lakes Railroad, there are many historical structures. Most of them date back to the early part of the ninth, or the later part of the 19th century. We have in Canandaigua, the passenger station still remains. In Shortsville, both the uh, freight and passenger stations are still uh, being maintained. We also have Clifton Springs, both uh, freight and passenger stations that uh, are maintained. And uh, Waterloo still has their freight station. And right here in Seneca Falls, we're very happy to have both the passenger and the freight station. The future of the railroad is bright. Finger Lakes Railway um, intends on maintaining our infrastructure to, um, to be able to accommodate passenger and freight services for years to come. This track has been here for 150 years and uh, we're going to make sure that it's here for another 150 years providing the same quality service that it does today. So the next time you're in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York, take a moment to experience the Finger Lakes Railway 
where history is still very much alive. The passenger schedule is usually announced at the end of April, so be sure to check the web for the latest information.